So everyone, welcome to the second show of this Starry Starry Night series. And again, we have an all-star lineup. And uh, <clears throat> also, we are learning our program along the way. So we feel like last time we were a little bit rushed. So this time, our goal is trying to cover basically about four questions instead of five, like last time. And that gave us more time to you know, talk a little bit more and digest. Um, the first question will be, we will go over what we did last time with that problem by James. Uh, because after the show, I got uh, people uh, from various WeChat groups or whatever, I started to notice this could be the question that people did not follow completely very well. And I also think this is a wonderful problem. So we should uh, you know, have a good revisit about, about it. <clears throat> uh, so I will take the lead on this one and you guys can you know, chip in. Um, <clears throat> I think I like James's original uh, comment. Uh, so Ivan, can you switch to here so we can see? Use my screen now. Okay, so in this diagram, right, I like James's original comment about why this kind of problem attacking roots are, uh, can you guys see well? Or should I go a little bit lower? Can you guys see well or bigger? The closer, the better. And the closer, the better. How about this? Good or not? So I can re read the problem again. Uh -huh. uh, we have an eight by eight checkerboard with alternating white and black squares. Yeah. How many ways are there to choose four black squares and four white squares mm -hmm. so that no two of the eight chosen squares are in the same row or column? Yeah. So in his original uh, explanation, he mentioned this old Canadian problem about this nine by nine one, and they want to choose, you know, say for example, eight uh, rooks in the black fields, and why that problem is quite hard. I think he explained it very well. He said, if you go with this kind of greedy algorithm, you take this one, for example, then this one, then this one, and this one, you think about you are doing some multiplication. But the issue is, it's not about how many choices you have. For example, if you choose this few, and then you choose this one, the last step, you have two choices. But what if you don't choose this one, but instead you choose this one as your seventh rook? Then your eighth rook will have what? Four choices. So that's the issue because it is so, so, so the problem is not every step they have what? An equal number of options. It's because of this odd and even things. They, if they are in the even position, they do not even attack the odd position. So that's the issue. So. So the reason I like this problem is this. When I take the team this year to the, to the HMMT, after a while, I saw the problem. And many of them, I try to sit there, in particular for those algebra, geometry, and accounting problems in the first four or five, or, or one, two, three, four, I try to use it, use my mental math, not uh, you know, using pencil and paper and think about it. And this is the problem I feel like, man, I do need a pencil and a paper you know, to think about it because I could not solve it without pencil and paper. So pencil and paper becomes a show of our, uh, becomes the name of our show because whenever you start to use pencil and paper, you start to do math questions. Uh, so I think to be a little bit more careful on this problem is the first thing is we have to understand why they are, because if you want four uh, rooks in this black fields and four rooks in this white fields, why it's very important to need two from this odd rows and then two from this what, even rows. I think that part is the part could be a little bit confusing to many students. So I think if you do it algebraically, you can see this way. I will give a try. So assume you have what, this is the black fields, right? 
So you have B odd, you have B odd of what? Uh, rooks in these black fields. And then you have B even of what? Rooks in these even fields. So they take positions odd odd. So we write it, write it one one. And we write this as what? Uh, zero, zero, it's even. And the same thing, if I do this white here, I have W odd, so W zero means how many rooks are in those odd positions. And then W even is in what? Even positions. And those coordinates are what? Uh, even zero one and one zero because they have odd positions here and even position on rows. So now if you look at his question, there are a few equations you guys can, can have. You know this, BO plus BE should equal to what? By condition, he wants four of them, mm -hmm. right? And by condition, you also have what? W zero plus W E is four. Do we have other equations? We haven't used the condition, they cannot attack each other, right? So that means what? They should cover all the numbers. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, as the what? Their coordinates, and the coordinates cannot overlap. So that means what? If I looking at the X coordinates, B O and W E should add up to what? Should be four because their X coordinates should cover every odd number. That's how they are not attacking because eight of them, right? They have to cover all the numbers. And so is what? If you're looking at an even position, uh, X co coordinates, then B O, B E plus what? W O should also equal to four. And if you're looking at Y coordinates, they have the same issue. So this number, BO plus WO should be four. So you have all those equations come out. And if you look at all those equations, then you realize all of them can only be two. That's the only way to make the, all these equations equal. So that's how you know you should have two coming from these positions, this odd rows, and you have two coming from even rows. And the same for this. So that's the two to come from, right? So to me, that's a big step because I'm a, a, while, while I was seeing the contest, I was like, why this has to be two, right? Because I know two works, but how do I know it's not three to one or other four to zero split? And this is how I tell my convince myself, this is, has to be true. And then the next thing I want to talk about this problem is this. Um, when we do this kind of grid problem, it has lots of what? When we do this kind of grid problem, it has lots of symmetry. And I think that the, the best way is what? Is try to use the symmetry, but to make the board kind of like unsymmetric in the sense of, I want to fix the board so I can see it better. Because if there are too many symmetries going on, you really don't know where I should multiply, where I should not multiply. So you want to fix the grid using symmetry and then make the grid is fixed. So it's unsymmetric. And now you can see what's the actual what, uh, position. So I think this is related to what James and Yannick was talking about when they say, now I want to switch rows now. So basically, you know this, you will have four of them from the black fields. So four of them, uh, uh, two of them are coming from these four rows, right? Two of the black ones are coming from these four rows. So that's why they were talking about, I can what? Do a what? Uh, four choose two. So I know what? So I know the rows are what? So I, I can move these two rows in the what? In the first quadrant. Uh -huh. I see. Right, I can move these two rows here now. 
So I can, because now I'm using symmetry. So I'm using any of these four rows. I need two of them, exactly two. So I pick what? Two of them here, right? So now I can say my two rows are these two rows because among these four, I can choose two. So I choose these two, it, it's a representative. So now I move things here, right? And the same thing for what? The four white ones, right? Is that true? So you have what? Four choose two also? Is that true? So that's give you 36, right? Yeah. And then what? So now I know what your, so where's the 36 square come from? Uh, guys, you can help me out a little bit here. What, what do I do? Uh, well, let's, let's think. Okay, so this is only about what? The rows, right? So now I know the two what? Two white rows, I can move them here. And exactly the same way I can move what? The columns. So that will be exactly the same. So that means I square. So now I can claim what? The four black ones are in this quadrant now. Right? And if the four black ones are in this quadrant, then the four white ones must be in what? This quadrant. So this is what I mean is using what? using the symmetry to fix the board. So now the board is very fixed. So I can see the position much better now. So in this, so in this position, how many ways I can choose them? I think I have four, right? Because I need to choose. I have four choices, right? Because now I have to choose four. I either choose what? This four or this four, right? Is that true? And sorry, so you always move <coughs> the black squares to the top left and the white squares to the bottom right? Right. So, so far, what have you assumed? So far, I assume the what? Uh, I have what? So where does the, f the first four choose two comes from choosing the first and third row, right? Yes. For the black squares on the odd columns. Yes. And the second four choose two is from choosing the second row and fourth row for choosing the two black squares on the even columns. Yes. Or even squares. Yes. So now, you, so, you so now, and then the other, this square coming from now, I can claim what? The black ones must be here and what? Is there Ivan, can you draw it on the, your screen? Um, yes. Second. I, I, I think I understood what we are doing, but um, would it be possible for simplicity? Look, James said that these are all odd black squares, right? And we can reposition them. We re can reposition columns and rows, right? And the picture picture is the same. So. I think we are confused because of this all, all um, the, the checkerboard coloring, but I, maybe it's easier to start we reposition and have all odd black squares here and all even black squares here. Is it true or not? Can we, can we reposition the board this way? and the rest become white and white, right? 
So there's, now, not, but there's not a unique way to reposition the board this way, right? There's many ways you can reposition the board into this way. I can, there's many ways for me to shift the four columns together, right? Correct, but I will not count that. I will just try to place four black and four white cells in this uh, new reposition. I'll, I'll, t I'll say this is my square number one, this is my square number three, five, and seven. So it, it will be just one, three, five, and seven here, right? So I will choose right now, I will solve this problem for reposition cells, uh, and I will not account for any column permutation. I just say it's a reposition. I'll solve the problem for uh, such grid. Right. So, so why don't you have to multiply by the number of ways in, for, to reposition the rows and columns afterwards? Because I have labeled uh, labeled cells. I don't know. Then I'm confused. So I would find four cells here four black cells and four white cells in, in the new board and all my cells are labeled from one to 64. They're labeled here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm repositioning them. I repositioned the columns, right? And I repositioned the rows. So my, my condition is still the same. No two, no two black, no two, um, white cells attack each other. Uh, okay, I see. So you're saying you're going to do a, an explicit relay, or you're going to explicitly move the columns in one particular way. Right, so in the first one, three, five, seven, I move th three close to one, five closer to them, uh, seven closer to them. And then here will be my cells two, four, six, eight. So I first rearrange my columns and then I can rearrange my rows and uh, my cells are still, I keep the track of their labels. And then we can see we need to choose what? Uh, four black cells. I cannot choose, I cannot four, choose four cells in this square because once I choose four cells in this square, none of these white could be chosen, right? In a similar way, I cannot choose three cells in this four by four square because I will have only left with, I won't have enough space for white. So the only way two black cells in each of these four by four squares. Does that make sense? Right, or, so uh, then the question is, how do we count the number of ways for us to actually choose these squares, right? Well, this is what Mr. Fung is doing. I need to choose first here. There, are, there will be two cells in this uh, blackboard, right? Do you agree? So first he said, we are going to choose two rows where these cells will be. So without loss of generality, four choose two, we choose two rows, let's say first and second, there will be two black cells here, right? And without loss of generality, we choose two rows here, four choose two where will be black cells, correct? And because it's a four by four, then we can choose the, the two columns they will be, right? So this is for rows in the first black cells, rows. Then I need to choose columns. The first column I can choose, in how many ways I can choose two. The columns are important, right? So in the first row, I can choose the column in the four way, four ways to choose first column and three ways to choose the second column, right? And then I can assume th these are my two black cells, right? And four ways to choose first column here and three ways to choose the second column here. And I choose these two, right? You can see why it's 12, why it's not four choose two because I can, if I chose these two rows, then I can, and these two columns, I still have kind of two possibilities to place, right? So that's why it's times 12, right? So once I put black squares, I need to put my white squares 
and what's left for white squares? Well, they can be only in this part, in these two boxes, right? I have four of them. So in how many ways I can place white cells? Uh, two ways here, times two for white cells, and two ways here. So altogether, it's six times 12 times two, six times 12 times two. I believe it's this. Yeah, I, I, We're good I, now. my take is I don't want to even move them. It's basically what I'm saying is, you know in this, because the way we can choose two columns random, uh, two rows and two columns randomly, we already got this four choose two, four choose two. And then we know there are four black ones here in this order. And two of them must come from the two odd rows and odd columns. So is this four that I'm marking, you need to have two. So that's clearly this pair or this pair. And among this four, you should have two. So it's either this pair or that pair. So that gives you this two by two. And in this corner over here, you know you are going to have four whites. And it's among this four, you need to have four. Uh, you need to have two. So it's either this pair or this pair. And among this four, you need to have two. So it's this pair or that pair, right? Okay, I think we spent too much time on this one. We should move on. Okay, guys, can you see? Yeah, your English is good, Ivan. Okay, so Jackson has a five by five grid of squares, another grid problem. He places coins on the grid squares at most one per square so that no row, no uh, column or diagonal has five coins. What is the maximum number of coins that he can place? Sure. So I guess, well, I guess the, this problem somehow like you want to place coins on the grid squares and you no know, row, column, or diagonal has five coins, right? So maybe at first it's like you have to keep track of 12 objects, right? Like you have to keep track of all of the rows, all of the columns, and the two diagonals. Uh -huh. So how do you group these 12 objects together so that you can keep track of fewer objects at the same time. Like you want to group the rows together because the rows are like independent of each other, right? Mm -hmm. And the columns are also independent. So what happens if you just, your condition is just the rows, the five rows, then what's the maximum number of coins you can place? Oh, I think it's 21, right? No? 21. Oh, uh, wait. No, you, no, no. You, you have the camera, 17. you can do it, right? Dress, sorry? 17, I don't know. <laughs> Let me think. Um, like if you're just allowed to have at most four coins on each row, I guess, because you can't have five coins on the row, right? So you have four coins on each row, and you have five different rows. So you can have at most 20 coins, right? But can you actually do 20 coins? Yeah, 20, uh, if I have 21, then definitely I'll have a row with five coins, right? That's what right. I meant. Right, so like the maximum is already only 20 coins, even if, even if you just have the five rows, right? Right, so we need to, 20, at most we can place 20, but that's kind of a big number, I don't know. We should try. Right, but like 20 is actually the maximum if you, only have the condition for rows, right? Because you can just place four coins on each row, like, man, like however you want. And the question is, how do you place four coins on each row while also keeping track of the columns and the diagonals? So I guess one thing you can do is, you can think about it as if like, in the, like in the previous problem we just discussed, as, as, as if they were rooks, right? Mm -hmm. If you're trying to place like five rooks on the grid so that they don't attack each other, then that those are the five squares you can have, you can not have a coin on, right? And then if you have that already, you can guarantee that no row or column has five coins, right? So what can you do about the diagonal?
well, somehow there's only two diagonals. So one way to deal with the diagonal is just to take the center square, which actually is contained in both diagonals, right? Okay, so we so don't think, put a coin here, right? Yeah, so I think if I work hard, I can even share my screen. Which, okay, Alex, you can go ahead. Yeah. Um, I forgot, here, here it is. Yeah, so I think... And that's an efficient way, right? Because this cell belongs to at least uh, two row, uh, one row, one column, and two diagonals, right? So if you go with the efficiency, you have to remove that cell, right? Well, you don't have to remove it, but it's like the most efficient cell, right? Because initially you have like 12 conditions. Like basically you have 12, you have five rows and then five column, right? Mm -hmm. And then two diagonals, right? So if you remove this cell, then that gets this one, you get rid of four, four of the conditions, right? Correct. And then if you remove for each of the other things, you can remove two more conditions because you can always remove a row condition and a column condition, right? So I'm just gonna remove this, however. So for the first one, I can remove four and the next four, I can remove two each plus two times four. And that's already 12, right? So I've actually removed all of the conditions. So how do we get talking about removing conditions though? Like we were initially talking about like these rows and columns, they have like four out of five, right? So we got to removing conditions by first assuming that the entire grid is full and then saying like, well, if the entire grid is full, then there's 12, sorry. If the entire grid is full, then there's 12 conditions right now that are violated and you can remove them, you can remove squares so that fewer of them are violated, right? So that's sort of like one motivation for like doing the complementary counting is like, initially, like, you know, the number is gonna be big because if you just randomly try to fill in squares, like you can get to a big number. And that's the motivation for like trying to do it with complementary counting. So Alex, you should probably stop your screen. And the next problem is the following, and we'll have a new poll for you. Uh, there are two indistinguishable flag poles, and there are 19 flags, of which 10 are identical blue flags, and nine are identical green flags. Find the number of distinguishable arrangements using all of the flags, in which each flag pole has at least one flag, and no two green flags on either pole are adjacent. So this is kind of like those stars in the bars, right? Clearly they're blue and the, and the flags are bars and the, you know, things like that to separate the stars like the green flags. It's the only yeah. issue is they are on two poles now, right? This, this is uh, Chris here. Uh, this is actually why I chose this problem for this uh, session here, because uh, it's called Starry Starry Night. It's a little uh, joke there, but um, yeah, I came up with this problem um, over a decade ago. I was reading actually a, the first chapter from a um, draft of a graduate combinatorics book written by a, um, professor from the University of Illinois, Doug West. And um, he had these problems on flag arrangements on flagpoles. And mm -hmm. I thought, hey, maybe I could write a good problem. I won't divulge the contest yet. Maybe we can contemplate which one this showed up on. But um, anyway, the point being that, um, yeah, there are some elementary methods that can be used to solve a problem that even showed up in a graduate textbook. Um, and it's actually kind of surprising how many students major in math and then they get to grad school and they've never had a formal introduction to combinatorics. So I kind of like that. And uh, I can also later, maybe another day, talk about why I chose blue and green. Um, but I will say that problems are autobiographical. So there's a backstory there. So uh, anyway. Um, are there any questions as to what the problem is asking for? I'm not able to see the Q&A. 
are we good to move on? Yeah. If it says that, sorry, someone asks, if it says it has at least one flag, can you put two flags on one flagpole? If it has at least one flag, can you put two flags on a single pole? Yeah, that's the question. Well, well, all the flags have to be placed between the two poles. So you have a total of 19 flags. So, you know, whatever's not on the first flagpole, I, I think of this as like, let's say a first and a second flagpole or a left flagpole and a right flagpole. So the first flagpole has to have at least one flag. Whatever's not on the first has to be on the second. So yes, it's indeed certainly possible that a flagpole has exactly two or more than two. Um, so, um, so is it like an alley you go walk and there are flags on the left and flags on the right, right? Sure. Sure. That's, that's one way of looking at it. Um, so I put together this deck just to kind of do some thought buildups to sort of think through this. So the, you'll notice that I have one more blue flag than I do green flags. I mean, I chose these numbers deliberately and the green flags, they can't go next to each other. Okay. But there's, there's nine of them and the blue flags can sort of act as separators. And so just cognitively, that idea of uh, objects and separators that should call to mind perhaps that there's going to be stars and bars or some people know it as sticks and stones or different you know physical metaphors. Um, so first I've just listed out here all flags just kind of alternating between blue and green. Um, now they don't have to you know turn out that way when they're ultimately distributed but we can ask like what are some valid ways to split the flags up. So if I let this divider represent, you know, to the left of it is what's on the yeah. left side. Mm -hmm. Huh? Question? Yeah, basically the divider give you two poles, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So what's on the left side of the divider is the arrangement from let's say bottom to top on the first flag pole. And then to the right of the divider is the arrangement from bottom to top, top on the right flag pole. So I'll just tell you here, in all of these three examples, I do have the correct number of blue and green flags. So um, what do we think? Is this what I've listed? Is this a legal way to arrange the flags? Mm -hmm. What are we getting? Maybe, did you, are you sure you have the right number of blue and green flags? Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I do have that for all of these. So you can assume that, but yeah, assuming it, that. It, it, it looks okay. Yeah, yeah, indeed it is. How about this one? Three blues, maybe too many blues. No, 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 no. All, all of these, I have exactly 10 blues and I have exactly nine greens. So you don't have to, I, I don't want you to have to worry about the counting part of it. I want you to think about the no two greens together part of it. Okay, also correct. I don't see any two greens. Right, now I should point out that uh, I don't know if I can annotate. Yeah, let me see if I can draw with the drawing tool. Um, you do have, I'm putting a little box around between the two flagpoles, like at the top of the first one, there's a green and at the bottom of the second one, there's a green, but that's legal because the condition only says you can't have two greens on the same pole that are adjacent, which means next to each other. So sure enough, this is also fine. So we'll, um, actually I'll. Yeah, you can stop. have two Gs together because that tells you a unique cut point basically, right? Yeah, uh, so let's see. So that's fine too. Um, now how about this one? No, two greens. In right, the we, we, on the second one at the bottom we have two greens, so we can't do that. Okay, uh, actually let me, just to, because it's a distraction, let me try to erase this if I can, eraser. Um, but you can read what I have, which is it's useful uh, when trying to attack these problems to adopt some useful notation. So because we have fewer green flags and because we have this constraint on the green flags, I'm just gonna say, all right, well, without loss of generality, like there's gonna be some number of flags on the first poll and then the rest will be on the second. And I'm gonna let this variable g sub n be the number of valid arrangements 
where the first flagpole has exactly green and green flags. So with that notation, what are we trying to calculate in terms of G sub n? What, what summation? Can, can someone uh, write down a, a sum? Um, sum over all of n of g sub n. But what what is n range over? <clears throat> What's the range? What, what are the limits? Well, you can range over whatever you want. Like it's a well defined well, statement, even though n is like pi. But like sure, you want one all the way to eighteen, right? Yeah. Uh, but there's only nine green flags. Is the thing from zero to oh, nine? So, so, yes. Sorry. I mean, yes. There's nothing that says that each flagpole has to have at least one green flag. Um, you know, for example, I could have, going back, uh, I could have this initial arrangement, right? And I could have like all of these on the first flagpole except for the last blue, which I could have on the second flagpole, okay? So, um, yes, so with this, notation that I've introduced, we want to find g sub zero plus g sub one up to g sub nine, basically the number of uh, valid arrangements where the left, the, let's say the first flagpole has zero through nine green flags on it. Um, okay, well, so one way to kind of break into this, uh, at least I think, is uh, let's just see if we can compute some um, simple values or maybe extreme values. So g sub zero, um, by our notation, that means that the first flagpole has no green flags. Um, so given that, um, that means that all nine green flags will be on the second flagpole. Um, so can we make any conclusions based off of that? Well, we have only blues, right? So you have one up to nine blues. Oh, up to 10, probably. Yeah. Yeah, we have 10 blues to place, but given that all nine of them, if we stick all zero, uh, if we took, if we have no f green flags on the uh, first flagpole, all nine green flags are on the second, then that forces you some of the blue flags. The black ones in between, right? Or, uh, uh, the blue ones in between, right? Right, right. So we know right off the bat that eight of those blue flags have to go between those greens. And so that leaves us with how many additional blue flags to play with? Any responses? Yeah, someone responded two. Two, right. And so, um, well, I've just repeated here what I just said aloud. Um, we know that the second flagpole has to have at least eight blue flags to sort of act as separators between the green, sorry, did I say green? Second flagpole must have at least eight blue flags to act as separators. And once those are in place, then we have a valid arrangement other than the fact that we still need to place those two blue flags. So we have two blue flags and we know because the first flagpole had no greens on it, we've got to put one of those blue flags at least on the first flagpole so that it has at least one flag. So what about the other blue flag? How many places can we put, place that? How many positions can we place that other blue flag? You, you, you place them all in any of those gaps, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have and ten. so, so how many gaps are there? Ten. Apparently nine or twenty. Yeah. Nine, twenty. Uh, any other answers that you're getting? Neither of them are, are, are correct, right? Well, not necessarily. Like, why, why nine? <laughs> well, let's just look at it case by case. If the other blue flag went on the first flagpole, that's how many cases? That's just 
what? One case, because you just have two blues and they're indistinguishable, right? So that's one case of where we could put the remaining blue flag. But what if that other blue flag went somewhere on the second pole? You, you know you have the nine greens, and between each pair of greens you have a blue, so you have this alternating green, blue, green, blue, up to green. How many positions are possible to place that remaining blue flag on the second pole? Well, you have two on the sides of the leftmost right, green and rightmost green. Right, you've got the two on the ends. Mm -hmm. and, and then it's in between right yeah right you've got eight the two on the ends and then you've got the eight in between and you don't have to worry about you know um the order because they're once again indistinguishable um and so this establishes that actually the g sub zero is 11 and i'll also remark that this immediately tells us what g sub nine is because sort of by symmetry if the nine greens were all on the first flagpole, then you just, without loss of generality, repeat the exact same argument, just pretending that the second flagpole is now the one without the greens, right? So we know there's a symmetry here, G sub zero, G sub nine, 11, okay. So <clears throat> where I, my mind goes next when I think about this one is, all right, well, if we're not in sort of those extreme cases, that is, there's a green flag on, at least one green flag on each pole. Um, can, can we compute the, the G sub n for those, you know, n goes from one to eight, right? So that if the first flag pole has n green flags, then by clear subtraction, the other remaining nine minus n have to go on the uh, second flag pole. And we repeat a very similar style argument about sort of this, you know, We've got to stick the blues in between any pair of greens that we have that are consecutive. So um, if we have n green flags on the first flagpole, then we'll have one fewer of them to act as separators. Therefore, the second flagpole, how many blue flags does that have to have? This is a question to the chat. Let's yes. see, guys, if you pay attention. Oh, I see the Q and A now. Eight minus n. Eight minus n. Yes. So it's it's basically one fewer than the number of green flags that we have. So, so that's eight minus n blue flags. Okay. Um, well, if we just add those two numbers of blue flags that we've already kind of allocated and positioned, that means that we've already used up n minus one blue flags on the first flagpole and eight minus n on the second, and conveniently the n's uh, additively cancel out, which means that we've already used up seven of the blue flags. And that means now that there's three that are free to go anywhere and we won't violate any of the um, adjacency conditions. Uh, I've just restated this. Seven of the blue flags have fixed positions relative to the green flags. Um, so these three blue flags can freely be distributed. Um, here's the question. Uh, this is another question for the audience. How many positions are there in which we could place a blue flag? In a sense, we've already seen this question, right? 10, three, or 17? 10, three, or 17. Uh, 11. 11. So um, I'm curious about like, I can, I can kind of see where three comes from. 17, I can also see where that comes from. Um, why 10? Uh, whoever said 10, uh, do you want to maybe... Or, or why 11? <laughs> That's close to 10. <laughs> sure, sure. But we can't, we, we, we don't want to be guessing here. We want to know that we've got all the possible places where we could stick the blue flags. Uh, so we've already seen like four different answers for that. So 
Well, yeah, it's like it's like basically like there's seven blue flags you already placed, right? Yep. So that's like seven spots where you can place a blue flag. Yep. And then you can also place it like on the two sides. Yeah. Right. So we've yeah, exactly. Regardless of how we've distributed the blue flags, we've got seven that are already placed. And if we put, you know, you know, we can put one of those free blue flags in any of those seven spots, and then we'll just have you know a bunch of blues that are together. And then you have the endpoints, as I refer to it, like the top and the bottom flags, right? So that's seven plus four. So it turns out in general, it's basically one more than the total number of flags that are on each poll, which would be n plus one plus 10 minus n. And again, the n's nicely cancel out and we have 11 possible places where a blue flag, of which there are three that we have to distribute can go. So, and if you notice the way the language I'm using, I'm talking about distribution problems and you know we have certain constraints right on how many and where so um i'm kind of setting this up but i'm not going to finish it off that's kind of uh an exercise for the viewer um and some of you may recognize this i'll, I'll just give this away as this was an amy problem but don't think that if you calculate an answer that you got it wrong because remember that on the Amy, they do, they, ha they have to make sure you have a three digit answer. Um, I remove that just to simplify the phrasing of the problem. So don't think that if you get something that's more than three digits that you, you messed it up. So um, I'm finally introducing this uh, variable B sub N, which is the number of blue flags in the nth position where I can number these positions one through 11, right? And obviously, the number of blue flags in any position can only be zero, one, two, or three. And what equation can we write down that describes the, the relationship between these B sub i's? That's a question we should be able to answer, right? And I think someone who answered an earlier question incorrectly might be able to get this one based on what that answer was. So what do we think? Are we getting anything, Alex? I'm not seeing anything showing up on the Q&A. Me neither. Maybe you need to ask the question again. Yeah. So we have B sub one, B sub two, up to B sub 11. That tells us how many blue, it's like a counter, how many blue flags are in the 11 positions that we said are possible. And we know that there's only three blue flags to go around and our number of blues can only be zero, one, two, or three. So what's the relationship between these different B sub i's? I think now we see an answer. Well, I see an answer. I see someone trying to answer the problem, but I'm asking just a more uh, kind of sim simple question about the relationship between the B sub i's. Uh, what's, what's that look like? They sum to three, okay. Um, that is indeed, oh. Well, I, I didn't even write it down. I guess I didn't have time to write it down, but essentially you have an equation B sub one plus B sub two plus up to B sub 11 equals three, where each B sub I is a non-negative integer. And obviously, so they can only be zero, one, two, or three. Uh, and many of you who have seen the technique will recognize this as stars and bars, which again, I thought was kind of an appropriate little nod to the title of this uh, series, Starry, Starry Night. Um, so I think that actually puts us at time, doesn't it? Yeah. Maybe next time we can talk about what people got or if people have questions still on this one. Um, so I don't know if Yvonne, if you want to wrap up or. Well, I don't know what to do. We have Evan. Uh... <laughs> right. <laughs> and well... lots of people waiting for his problem too. Uh, I don't know what to, to decide. Up to you, I can go either way. Yeah, I think we kind of ran a little long on the first two. I mean, it was a good discussion, I, I'll, I'll give you that, but um, yeah.
So I'll, I'll just say for my part, I think I'm, I'm done for this uh, portion of the problem. I don't want to give it away. I want people to play around with it. And, you know, if you haven't solved a problem like this before, just think about the foregoing discussion we've had and we can talk about, it's not about what the answer is. It's really about how did you think through this and analyze the situation. Um, and uh, like I say, it comes from an Amy problem from I think 2008, it was an Amy two problem number 12. Um, my name is, by the way, Chris Jewell. So I'm kind of a guest host. I'll be off and on joining these, so. Um. Actually, I think your question, there's a way of doing it, not the very kind of ah. like from what you do. Mm -hmm. Kind of like uh, arrange all the green flags in two ways. One is they make sure they have a uh, blue flag in between. Yep. And you're looking for the whole thing, all 19 flags. And then you say, okay, if I arrange that way, I basically can cut it in, in what? 18 different places to form the two flags. Mm -hmm. Then you force out a, 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 the second case is you have two green flags together. And yep. the rest of them are gapped. And then you have a unique place to cut. Ah, okay. And then you add them together, you, then you, you should get your answer too. <clears throat> yeah. Right? I think that'll work, yes. Yeah. That sounds good. <clears throat> so. Um. I know. So I hope this was useful. I, I, um, I think, I don't know, I guess it's between Ivan, Zuming, whether we want to, uh, what, how we want to we wrap up here. We can give, yeah, we can. We, we can maybe throw out the problem, uh, give the problem out and then have people think about, I don't know. Sure. So if you guys, if you have to go, um, we will record our session and you can see all of it. So we have one more problem that we prepared for you. Chris, can you please close, oh, yes. close your document? Yes, and this is the following one. <coughs> Prove that there exists a positive integer n, uh, less than a million, such that five to the n has six consecutive zeros in its decimal representation. We will do this next time or in two weeks when Evan comes back. Do you want to say anything about the problem, Evan? Oh, oh, I can't. Oh, do you want me to do it now? I was under the impression we were letting off. No, no, no. Just like general comments, maybe like. Uh, okay. Uh, maybe, sure, maybe I can do you that. You want to hear some stories, right? Yeah. Like maybe not like how to solve the problem, but just just like some stories about the problem. Okay. Uh, one moment. Let me get my. Like, like maybe what inspired it? Like what I was talking about? How I got my idea for the flags? Something like that. All right. Uh, let me set up my camera thing then. Yeah, I had this all set up. Uh, all right. Okay, I'm going to press the share button and hope that this thing still works. All right, can people see me? Yeah. Great. All right, so. Yeah, so the story behind the problem, I guess, isn't about zeros per se, but really about powers of five. And the way it comes about is I was looking at the sequence of powers of five, which starts with just five, and then 25, 125, 625, and then you go 3,125, 15,625, 78125, I hope. So someone correct me if I make, make a mistake because I'm making these up on the spot. And three, nine, zero, six, two, five. And what you see is when you look at the sequence of powers of five, this is the first one that shows up. If you're doing the problem, this is a good place to start. It's like, well, why can't I get a zero at all? It's three, nine, zero, six, two, five. 
But when I was looking at this problem, I wasn't actually looking for zeros in particular. I was actually looking at just powers of five. And I was like, well, actually, it's not the 0, 6, 2, 5 that interests me. It's this bit here with this entire chunk, 0, 6, 2, 5. Where does this guy come from? Well, we've seen this number before. It's this 0, 6, 2, 5 all the way up here. And so I was like, well, I mean, I ought to be able to get this whole chunk again if I start grinding out more powers of five. Mm -hmm. I get one, nine, five. All right, this is where it gets very dangerous. Nine, seven, six, five, six, two, five, uh, <laughs> four, eight, eight, two, eight, one, two, five, I hope. No, that's definitely wrong. Uh, uh, no, that's fine. Okay, two, four, four, one, four, zero, six, two, five. And then this thing shows up again. It's this chunk here, zero, six, two, five, and then that's the zero that I want. So when you have that, you can immediately start asking some questions like, well, mm -hmm. those of you with experience with modular arithmetic will already know that it's not surprising that a block of things is repeating. Um, things will repeat modulo any number eventually. But here I have the zeros that keeps coming up. And I was like, okay, well, there's a couple of questions you can ask. One is like, how can I get this block? You know, I can get this block to keep appearing, but there's other blocks that are appearing as well. There's this three, one, two, five that keeps showing up. There's three, one, two, five, and would show up if I computed the next one, but I'm not going to go past that point. And the second question is like, well, if I can get blocks to repeat, can I get those blocks to have zeros in them? Because here you see there's a zero that keeps showing up in the fourth decimal place, but we can't get zeros anywhere else. And I think that's probably all I really have time to say, but this is sort of how I thought of the problem. It was like, I came up with this idea. This zero keeps showing up. How can I make these blocks keep appearing? And how can I make that um, initial string of zeros longer? And if you do that, you can get the JMO 2016 problem. So we end up here? Yeah, we're probably a little over, so I don't want to hold everyone too long. Yeah. Have a good night, everyone. Good night.